Well, when I got there, it was it was violent. Everything yeah. that you heard about Walpole was true. Uh, it was predatory. Every day was a freeze up. Every single day, it wasn't like um, once a month. Or, and when I talk about freeze up, it wasn't just no you know fist right. fights. You know, there, people things. being stabbed water hot water boiling water was being thrown on mm -hmm. folks you know it was it was crazy folks was being you got a moment when they see you down there's no Hey everybody, welcome to the Bounce Back podcast. I'm your host B Luke. I got a special guest with me today. One of the most requested men I've had. Without further ado, tell the people your name, where you're from, and a little bit about yourself. Oh, well, so my name is Matt Hudson. I was born and raised in Boston, inner city, Roxbury, Dorchester area. Mm -hmm. uh, I came up when times were really hard. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, being in street life got me also locked up for 33 years, mm -hmm. serving time mostly for a crime I didn't commit. Eventually, uh, parole came full circle and decided that, you know, take a closer look at my circumstance and then agreed that there was something wrong with my particular case and paroled me. So here I sit now, uh, work for Prison Legal Service, part of the Racial Equity and Correction Initiative. Also, I've built my own nonprofit called Access Mass, nice. and uh, we're doing a lot of racial equity work. So why don't you department. tell me a little bit about how that parole works? Because I have a little brother, he's been down 15 years now. He's proclaimed his innocence ever since. He has a parole hearing coming up. He's a little, mm. you know what I mean, nervous about it because you know how that is. If you're not trying to admit to your crime and admit your guilt and your fault, they, a lot of times they're not trying to hear that. So why don't you just talk about your experience with that, how'd that work out? Well, I mean, I would have been out earlier if I had just said, you know, that I did the crime. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm talking about a whole maybe 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. So in my my turnaround came about 33 years. You know, 15 is when I was able to see parole. Mm -hmm. And I asserted it at the very beginning, just like at trial. And, and at that time, the climate, the political climate was such that you know, it was really a non-rehabilitative, uh, non-what uh, I would say counterproductive towards any means of just recognition uh, on your own value of whether or not you had the merit to be paroled based mm -hmm. on your conduct or what have you, as opposed to the mission of the crime. The mission of the crime was like number one for a very long time. Yeah. I think at the time that I've seen parole, there was a there was a loosening because there were so many people that we had to acknowledge now that the Massachusetts had to acknowledge was wrongfully convicted mm -hmm. that parole couldn't just say now you know given mass incarceration given all the circumstances of crooked police officers mm -hmm. that they could not just say it's beyond possibility right. so all the officers involved in my case was the officers that was involved in that infamous child steward case so you know and as we know they tampered and messed with the identification and that's my that's my issue they did the same with me as they did many others so there's a whole bunch of mm -hmm. us that are sitting that's some are still sitting behind the wall and that we're hoping that the attorney general and others will soon address. Absolutely. Was there ever a point where maybe somebody came up to you or even you said it yourself like, bro, you just got to go in there and say you did it. You're sorry. You get out, worry about it when you get out. Well, let me tell you something. I mean, quite honestly, just like I told the parole board, you know, like you don't think that at any time I've contemplated about coming in here just saying I did it just to, to get out. But I've seen the end results of that. Mm. You know, I've seen folks who've done that and then the consequences of it was that they regretted it in the end. Some of mm -hmm. them went out, started getting high, came right back, you know, and whether they understood it or not, the whole mechanism, the triggering mechanism was that they, they never felt right doing what they did, but they compromised themselves in that way, right? And and I'm talking about model, model inmates mm -hmm. who never got in trouble, never, no. you know, did anything, right? And that was the end result of them. So I had a little bit of history ahead of me that I could, you know, draw on to see those types of end results in which a lot of folks didn't. So the one thing I heard about you is you're kind of a beast with the legal work, so to say. Did you, when did you start to look <laughs> well, into that and learn about that? Well, I started that from, a, from the beginning. So, mm -hmm. you know, I was a stick-up kid mm -hmm. um, when I was out. And, you know, I was involved in street life. That was my thing. 
And I, I never felt right about someone taking anything from me. And so from the very beginning, I wanted to learn the law because I felt, you know, you know they took my life based yeah. on something. And you got to understand, at the time when I went to trial, you know, they offered me 18 to 20, which meant I would have just did 11 and some change. I could have possibly knocked that down to eight years mm -hmm. for everything, you know, just yeah. for everything. And I said, well, look, I'll take that for everything that I did do, but this one particular case I didn't do. Mm -hmm. And so they said it was all or nothing. And I said, okay, nothing. You know, I'd rather go to trial then because I didn't do yeah. that, you know. And so for me, it was never about not taking accountability. You know, when you come up in the streets, and it's kind of like what I explained to the parole. When you come up in the streets, you know, you do the crime, you do you, you do the time. That's yeah. that's the model. We understand right. that as a consequence of our lifestyle choices. Mm -hmm. But when you didn't do it, then it's like, okay, look, you got this wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there was evidence of that. I mean, there were, they still was identifying me for other robberies that they knew that I didn't do because I was sitting in Child Street Jail. Wow. And the court prevented me from introducing that. And the descriptions in those case, in that particular case, was identical to the description in this case, right? So, mm -hmm. this is the type of when you talk about injustice, and then you talk about how the racial, the racial plays into that inequity. You know, a lot of us are sitting behind the wall. You know, whether it's poor. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's the poverty issue or whether it's the, the race issue, for, for some of us, it's double because we come yeah. from poverty-stricken communities and the race issue interplays where, you know, what they, who, who, who yeah. they care about this young black kid right. coming up? You know what I'm saying? Like, well, it could be one of those things, too, where they look at your record and be like, man, he probably got away with so much more. And they justify kind of convicting someone, even well, if they may know. First, this was my first adult offenses. Oh, so this is so I was convicted first? at 17. OK. OK. <laughs> so, you know so, OK, so that's pretty young. OK, because you <laughs> yeah. said you were a stick up kid. I thought maybe you yeah. had caught cases. As a, as a young as a young kid, that's what I came up doing. You know, any so. juvenile time at all? Yeah, I did. A, I did. I did juvenile did, time. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So I was always in and out of juvie. So let's just, let's bring it back a little bit. Home, what was the home dynamic like? Both parents in the house, brothers and sisters? So I, I got a lot of siblings. My moms and my, my father weren't together, you know, but my father was in my life. And, and so there was, I would say for most part, like every single mother who yeah. has to work a nine to five, sometimes extra hours, mm -hmm. right? You know, they don't, it's not the proper support for the children in the house. And mm -hmm. so I had to grow up fast because I had a lot of early responsibility, you know, to make sure that my brothers, my younger brothers and sisters were right. Yeah. It being what it is, it kind of robs you of your childhood. So you learn a lot of things quickly, yeah. uh, fastly. And then when you add that on the poverty, on the poverty side, which we, we, didn't, we didn't afford much, mm -hmm. the people that seemed like they could afford much was always in the streets. Mm -hmm. You know, they, you're looking, you, you observe this thing, and you're just like, oh, wow. Uh, this dude got a brand new pair of Adidas. He mm -hmm. got a brand new sweatsuit. He got a brand new, you know, just as kids, you observe this stuff. So I think eventually, of you know, you want to be involved, and then you kind of, for us, most of us understood that school just wasn't a learning place. It was everything but that, right. you know. And so once we picked that up, it became about everything else, you so know. Talk about your experience as a, as a student in school in general. Were you getting in trouble in school? How were I was always in advanced class, whatever that means, mm -hmm. you know, and I. I I always seriously question that because, you know, like I said, for us, we knew school wasn't teaching us much. So, you know, and I could be, you know, you got to understand, I came up in Reaganomics, you mm -hmm. know, when there was a lot of cutting to the budgets for social uh, programs, and that impacted the black and brown communities, as I'm sure, white mm -hmm. communities across the United States. But it had its most impact on black and brown. And from out of that, you know, you got the creation of rap, you know, music, mm -hmm. because they we had to experiment and figure out other, you know, dynamics of how to create music, right? Since those music programs and stuff like that were lost to us. Um, so I experienced um, just the rural of mm -hmm. streets, of street life after a while. Um, I think when you come up young, ignorant, not knowing what you think you know, 
um, and then trying to get there the best way you can, there's a lot of pitfalls, you know, um, that okay. you fall into. Unfortunately for me, I fell into a lot of those things, and I would say willingly because I thought that those were the right decisions. And I bathe in that. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you want to be seen. You yeah. want to be recognized some kind of way. Yeah. And I think for most of us coming up, that's what it is, is we want respect. We want to recognize. We understand that the people who got it, you know, they're out here, who, they got the beautiful women, they got the beautiful mm -hmm. cars, they got the, all these right. things, you know, they're out here doing these things. So you want to you emulate what you see, yeah. you know, and then you want to strive to be the best at that, mm -hmm. you know. And so the number one fear or the number one thing for most black and brown young men or young teenagers that want to be respected, they yeah. want to be seen, you I, know. I and that. so there's a leveling of competition going on. And at the height of what that went, you know, I, I want you to kind of understand that the height of that, you had the introduction of gangs. And why, it's why I say it that way is because gangs never existed in Boston at that time. That was something created by media design and really fanned the flames through the media. Right. You know, and I, this, I'm telling you this firsthand mm -hmm. as the first generation of that, right? of young folks going into prison and then, you know, uh, the gang life coming to coming to right. culture here in Massachusetts and especially particularly in Boston Mass, you know, they would show up asking us, what gang are you from? Right. And that was a foreign concept. For us, we only had crews, mm -hmm. you know, we only understood, you know, the concept of crews because you would have people that live on the street that they ran. There was just two or three of them that ran. That was their crew. Right. You know, <laughs> you know, by neighborhood. It's, but it's like not everyone in that neighborhood is active and doing kind it, of street things too. There's grandmas that's from the same neighborhood, but they're not gang members. You know? Exactly. So, you know, once once they started fainting that, you know, you, that was on the heels of colors, and then they mm -hmm. started planting that that subjectiveness in our minds. Some of us started playing into that. Mm -hmm. Now you got Humble Street Gang. Now you got Castlegate Gang. Now you got Interville. Now you got Academies. Yeah. Now, you know, now you have these these raiders these mm -hmm. you know it's it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper and we don't understand how we're being manipulated for someone's budget so that right. they can eat off of all of us and dispense us as cattle and that's wow. what they did you know that first young generation i always say they tried to kill us because they sent us to high maximum security when walpole was walpole mm -hmm. and it was dangerous you know and all of us coming from all across massachusetts had to band together, you yeah. know what I'm saying, for our own survival. And that was real, you know. So a lot of us came up in that strife, and we we went to war, you know. We had to make our points, you know, and we did. Um, but at the inception of all that, for me, you know, one of the things that was important, even through that turmoil, it was learning the law. You know, I, I saw what they did to me. When you're from the streets, you already kind of understand when someone is doing some crooked stuff. You may not mm -hmm. be able to articulate it, but you, you know, <laughs> you know when some crooked stuff is going down. And, and so that was true for me. And I just felt like I wasn't being represented in the best way. And when I talked about certain things that I would like to see come out, you know, I was told, you know, by my attorney at the time, well, you filed the motion, mm -hmm. you know, and and me being a young 17 year old what what motion am i going to file right. you know like i don't know anything about that so you know i i think at the end for me my attorney my first attorney he had in his mind what he thought was going to happen mm. you know he thought they was going to introduce allow us to introduce the misidentification the previous misidentification where i just explained yeah. that i was locked up at the time and this description fit the description of the folks that were wow. in this case now for clarification is this a paid paid attorney court appointed court appointed court appointed yeah okay. so I, you know once that went upside down you know i see, i could see the shift mm -hmm. you know like then he, he was kind of at a loss, mm -hmm. but he was trying to now fight from a sinking position, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, uh, you know, that always costs the client at the, at the yeah. end of the day. So I vowed from that day that I would never allow s someone to have my life in their hands without me being able to weigh in meaningfully on what decision that needs to be made. And mm -hmm. so that's what propelled me to learn the law. 
Okay. Um, and I did. Okay. So before we get into Walpole, and you had even mentioned Charles Street, which I'm interested in, but what was the juvenile system like back in the day? Where were you locked up, and what was your experience with that? Was that an in and out thing, kind of like a long term? Um, so I was in and out, Daniel, probably since the age of 12, all the way up until my um, adult incarceration. And yeah, I spent I spent some time um, there, learned a lot of things there. It was violent there. Mm -hmm. The adult staff were beating up the kids like they were, yeah. you know, uh, a, you know, yeah, and. And so we learned how to fight grown men from being in DYS, yep. you know. Um, so, I mean, that was the experience. So where, where was it? Is it Rosendale? I was in Rosendale. I was in Westfield. Westfield was where, where they really would beat you up at, too, mm -hmm. out there. Um, Westboro. I've been to all the high securities in there throughout, this, yeah. throughout the system. I've been through some residential programs also. I think only one of them I've ever completed, which was the Pilgrim Center. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. The rest of them I was thrown out. So yeah, that was my trajectory in the system, but okay. it, the, it was violent in yeah. the system, in, in the DYS. And I don't mean necessarily the kids. The, the staff, especially, <laughs> I, did, I seen staff from maybe this, like you said, neighborhood and knowing there's other kids from his neighborhood and there's other kids from the other neighborhood, lock, lock people in the cell. With, yep unfair number you know what mm -hmm. i mean so yeah definitely and if you don't got you know you got nobody really mm -hmm. once you figure that out like oh they're not right. here to help me right you know it's a tough thing to experience well you know kid. you kind of solid you know dys kind of solidifies you know, I, I think it's true all yeah. the way around the board you got some staff that believe in what they're doing and mm -hmm. trying to assist and help and then you got some that just there for the check they don't really care yep. either way but they harden you, the environment hardens you because if you don't truly understand what you're undergoing as a young kid, and most young kids don't, you know, that separation just from the family and, and the yeah. disconnect during the visits, it's like, it, it, it really makes for a dangerous recipe mm -hmm. because you come out more bitter and upset. And then that really solidifies your position and going back to doing what you've been doing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I think that's the way a lot of these systems work. Gotcha. So walk me through the events that lead up to you catching that case. As you said, you were 17. Are you still committed to DYS at this point? Do they try to violate you or are they more like you're there? You're the adult systems problem so you gotta, now? You got to understand. I was committed till I was 21. Okay. So a youthful offender. Yeah. Okay. So no, youthful well, no. offender didn't even exist. Oh, okay. So at the, at the age of 18 is when you become an adult and you charge with an adult. This has always been true. Right. So anything else that you ever been told about that is a stone cold lie, right? When they sent us all up there at the age of 17, it was illegal. It wasn't supposed to try us as a dope. In the, in the juvenile system, there's a bound over system in which they put you through to determine whether or not you can be amendable in DYS or you, you're, you're beyond amendable, therefore they have to charge you as an adult, right? Mm. They bypassed that whole, pro that whole process and decidedly someone made a decision that they was gonna prosecute young black and brown folks all across America. So this just wasn't unique in Massachusetts. This was something yeah. that they had created the political dynamics for, fanned the flames, the flames of it, and then implemented it and my generation was the first to fall into that you know gotcha. and so just so that you understand you know this has always been the long-standing the old hey, stand, long-standing okay. practice my brother under me um that's older than me came in at 17 in dys for a stolen car mm -hmm. and you know turned 18 and See. was done with dys yeah. so this was something you know, there's precedent for this interpretation. They took the word, which is unbelievable to me, between ages 11 and 17 to exclude, mm. meaning not 17, you become an adult, even though every law says wow. 18. Wow, because my, <laughs> my first case was, was 17. I So by, I aged out at 18, and but I always, and they actually messed up the Habe, mm -hmm. so I didn't even get Habed in from juvenile. So right off the rip, my first adult, oh, um, I'll stand a warrant, which was just technical, but they bring it up every time. Mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, 
Yeah, so, it's, it's crazy how that went down. I was not aware of that myself. I'm like, whoa, I thought I was till I was 18. But that, like you said, you got to educate yourself. And it's important if you're going to, especially if you're going to be in that life. And that was part of the fight with my attorney because, you know, they in court, they told me, they said I was 18. And I told my attorney, no, I'm 17. And so he presented that to the judge. And then I don't know what happened behind closed doors, but he never pursued it. Wow. But here's the thing. I mean, if it had not been for Brian Stevenson, it's been, you know, which then raised the whole issue of prosecuting young 17-year-olds only on the Eighth Amendment violation, right, as a cruel and unusual punishment because they outlive the adult offender almost twice wow. their, you know, twice their age. If that had not, door had not opened, a lot of, a lot of young youth offenders who were illegally tried. Yeah. But the question has never been dealt with about how Massachusetts and others had illegally, that had clear law on the books of how they dealt with juveniles at, their t at that time and had no precedent for prosecuting 17 year olds because of the statute that was in place. Wow. Wow. You know what I'm saying? They, they have not rectified that. They have not made us whole. They're pretty much ex exploiting like a loophole almost, it seems like. So it wasn't never like a law. No, it's passed. not a loophole. Nothing, or it's not no loophole. It's just a straight violation of, of the law. Of the law itself. And how come they could get away with it? Prosecute, prosecutorial misconduct is, is what punishable by being fired. But why are they not charged criminally? They should be held to a higher standard than us. B, I tell you in all honesty, it, it just not wasn't it just wasn't a prosecutorial decision. This mm -hmm. was something to judge. Everyone had to be looking the other way. In Massachusetts, there's been a long-standing practice of you turn 18, you're treated as an adult. Somewhere along the line, someone made a decision, and universally, this was applied almost in every state to prosecute young black and brown boys wow. at large, disproportionate numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. So not to say that whites weren't impacted because mm -hmm. they were, you know, but the large proportion were black and brown folks. And even the whites was probably in an urban setting. So let's be honest. You know what I mean? Fact. It's a, come Fact. From, it's a lot of the same places Fact. a lot of times. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Fact. Yeah. Absolutely. And so so the question is, is how do they all turn a blind eye to that? The judges? You mean the judge didn't recognize that neither? Mm -hmm. The lawyers didn't recognize that neither? I mean, some of the lawyers I've seen fought you know, file uh, this, what I would call redundant claims with the court, like felony murder. Mm -hmm. For years, they was kept filing briefs about this felony murder, felony murder, felony murder, even though the court kept rejecting it. Eventually, the court said, okay, let's take a look at this, mm -hmm. and then decided to say, we need to add a lot more clarity to this, right? So that we understand what does that mean? And so the whole aiding and abetting became defined for the purposes of a joint venture out mm -hmm. of that, right? So why did they take that same strategy when it came to prosecuting young black males, black and brown males, or young kids, period, at the age of 17 in conflict of the clear established law? Why didn't they use that strategy? Yeah. So we, there's a lot of questions raised, you know, that mm -hmm. I think that, you know, you know, a lot of complicity, yeah, you know, yeah. it's just not Conspiracy, one, it's not, it's not as easy to say, oh, it's just the prosecutor, the lawyers, the judges, everyone looked the other way. In your opinion, how, how can that be rectified? I think for, what they need to do is to go back and to really invalidate all those convictions for those 17 year olds, particularly in Massachusetts where the law was wow. clear, mm -hmm. right? Invalidate those in those convictions wow. and treat them as juvenile. That's how the only way you make them whole or you create a process in which the, uh, the governor has wow. in commutation to commute those, commute those down or parting those based on that so that they don't ill affect those yeah. young juveniles at that particular time, right? I think what Brian Stevenson did was wonderful and magnificent in order to make sure that you didn't have, you know, uh, young men, you know, dying in prison that were amendable, that, you know, you can't write them off, right? right? But, I, but I think that's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole story now is 
when we talk about mass incarceration and we look at the mechanics of the mechanisms to it, we have to then deal with the reality of what folks did in conflict of direct law. Mm -hmm. And then people should be held accountable for that. Mm -hmm. You know, so even if you don't want to do the accountability piece, then at least do the reparational mm. aspect of it, which still impacts people's lives. And you gotta think that has such a domino effect too, because like I said, my first case distribution, class D, 17 years old, I went upstate second subsequent. If I was a juvenile, exactly. and I'm sure there's plenty of armed career, all mm -hmm. sorts of things that it, that it would affect as well. Fact, so, fact, absolutely. Uh, hopefully that's something, what are the steps to get things done that way? How, what's the first step? Do we need petitions? Do we need people writing the governor? Well, right now, I mean, we've talked, we've spoke with the attorney general's office about this. Um, we've held forums, symposiums mm -hmm. in the community, something that we're going to continue to do. Uh, to raise awareness because most people don't understand what really happened to yeah. us and there's a there's a duality of how the system works for black and brown folks particularly and even poor whites will will still receive most of the benefits but not all the benefits right not as opposed to those who can afford mm -hmm. uh, clear representation and I and I would say sometimes even in Massachusetts where we think is a paid lawyer is is it's crumbs in the big scheme of right, things right. you know you know well, we you th think that's the get out of jail <laughs> free card right you're putting the money away for the paid lawyer but we're we're tricked into believing that that that's the case and it's not always the case so i think that for me what's important is the is that it should be rectified and in that massachusetts should not be allowed to get away with that, you know, and we should continuously make noise about that until someone recognize that and make that a part of these political campaigns all across Massachusetts mm -hmm. to rectify this, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. that is what makes America one of the greatest places to be, right? right? That we can seek redemption in a place where they say, you know, they believe in that, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Which is rectifying wrongs. Right. And so, you know, if that is true, and I think there's always an, a longstanding question of what they say in paper and what they do by action. But I also mm -hmm. think in terms that if you if you look at the history, right, that, you know, there's always this a longstanding question of whether or not black and brown folks are really citizens period yeah. and there's another thing that is highly disproportionate affecting black and brown you had mentioned joint venture if you just want to kind of explain that a little bit too for the people that may not know the way that they have used joint venture first joint venture is anybody that picks up a case um that's two or three more people involved that's complicit in the crime itself and complicit just means that they acted to further the crime, support the crime. The way the prosecutors have really used this is really to say, if you was merely there and did not participate, or you couldn't have even known that the crime was no going down. No premeditation. Yeah. No premeditation, no nothing, and someone goes off out and just walks down the street that, you, that you're accompanying, pulls out a gun and shoots somebody. The fact that you was there and might have ran mm. because you were scared, makes it complicit mm -hmm. and if you're not willing to testify on your friend mm -hmm. who may have done that crazy stuff right mm -hmm. then you know what we're going to charge you as a joint venture so this mm -hmm. is how they weaponize it and so many folks have today are sitting behind the yeah. wall for a crime they didn't did not know it was going to happen mm -hmm. and did not commit themselves even though they have the person who did commit it and acknowledging it in most cases the person who did do it got lesser time. I think what happens is, is that the Commonwealth has a theory. It's only a theory, mm -hmm. but they present the theory as a fact. And then oh, okay. it's, it's the jury that has to decide it. So if they're unsure, if the evidence to them say that one or the other is the principal, well, and this is still hotly contesting, they'll charge both people as the principal and as the joint venture and then let the jury sort it out on who they think is the joint venture or who they think is the principal, wow. right? And that's almost unheard of because the bill of particulars allow you to get the specifics on what you're being charged with mm -hmm. so that you can defend that at trial. Right. So how can I be the principal and someone else be the principal at the same time, mm -hmm. you know? And I've seen people not even knowing what 
joint venture was or even hear that term until trial. And like you said, where's the due process? And the principal is the person who did the crime. Yeah. The principal is the person who's responsible for the crime. The joint venturer is just the person who happened to be there. Mm -hmm. Or or in cases where they did more than just be there, but served as a lookout, served to tell them, yo, look, I, yo, let's get out of it, whatever the case may be. You know, those are, those are the two different levels mm -hmm. of culpability. So on a large part, they've been convicting many people just on the presence of just being there, even though the law clearly says that they're being there is not enough but if you don't cooperate with them and they feel like that's what they you know that's they become vindictive yeah. you mm -hmm. know and they'll they'll charge you accordingly and make you fight that case and then you know because you didn't do nothing you're going to go to trial mm -hmm. and expecting that trial is going to work its process out sometimes it does sometimes it don't so why is it important for your average civilian or taxpayer that may not know about this to kind of tell them what's going on, what's going on in there. Well, a lot of, let me tell you something, most taxpayers don't know how the justice system works. Yeah. They just don't get it. They they never had to unless they've been subjected to it themselves. This is why you had mm -hmm. such a big split when the O.J. Simpson thing mm -hmm. came out and everybody watched that on TV and was surprised at the verdict that came out. And I would say surprise is because it, it and I would say whites were surprised. Mm -hmm. I think that blacks just automatically figured he was going to be convicted because that's the way justice system works, yeah. you know, but they was happily surprised when he wasn't. I think whites were surprised because that was the first time they really got a chance to look at the justice system up close and personal and try to understand the mechanics of how it worked. Mm -hmm. And then to see that it did not work in the way that they thought it should work, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that was what happens to all of us. Yeah. You know, when we undergo trial, we kind of have that Perry Mason <laughs> thing in our minds and we think that, well, the truth is going to come out anyway. Yeah. At least I thought that way. And when it did end, when it, you know, when I was convicted of the, of the crime I didn't commit, I was just like, yeah. like, oh, it does not work mm -hmm. that way. Wow. And, you know, and, and so, so most of us, we, we go into an immediate shock in, in, of disbelief. Yeah. You know, and so I think most of most civilians just do not understand those rights. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't understand what those rights mean and tell. Um, they understand white privilege, mm -hmm. of course. I think that's something that most white folks understand. But they don't understand, like, when they look at what just happened with Donald Trump mm -hmm. and the debate on whether or not, as a convicted felon, can he run for president? Mm, right. Yep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And they're saying, well, why wouldn't he be? You know, like, why would he be? He wouldn't be able to, to do that. I mean, does it say anywhere in the Constitution? I'm not uh, so, that a convicted so felon. So under my really understanding, sure. my, and I'm going to say limited understanding, mm -hmm. that a convicted in person cannot okay. serve as president. You know, okay. cannot serve as president. Gotcha. It's just my that's my understanding of the law mm -hmm. and the application of it what i've learned watching politics over the years that people blur the definitions to what they want them to be mm -hmm. and and sometimes you can get as many people to believe in that yeah. even though it's contrary to the and a lot of times they're purposely vague or the confusing language <laughs> you know it's it's like it's like i said i've I've seen many interpretations of law that you kind of say how do you get that interpretation right. when it's clear you know but i think what happens is it's like you know um with the issue of abortion we've seen a lot of the um supreme court justices who come and say hey no i wouldn't use my judgment or what have you but in their own personal lives they determined right. that that is a wrong th interpretation of the law mm -hmm. and that the law does not mean that and some of which have written dissertations yeah. to that level right but then when they got the opportunity to get on the bench now we see mm -hmm. the uh, we see that coming out the yeah. fruition of that coming out but where the interpretation come from it came from their slanted view of what right. already Roe versus V. Wade mm -hmm. already said was an established thing, right? right? Yep. And their disagreement with Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the wrong application of the law. You mm -hmm. know, so that's what I mean by that. If you say something long enough um, and you create 
the opportunity for that change. It can happen, yeah. you know. Why do you just kind of, what, how do you get locked up for this murder case? What, walk me through the events. Is that something they just pull you over one day? Hey, you got a warrant for this? No, nah, so I was someone that was active in street life. So, mm -hmm. you know, I got locked up on a bunch of cases, mm -hmm. you know, some of the, you know, most of those cases I, I committed yeah. yeah, and I pled guilty to those cases. So, you know, like I've always explained, I wasn't some like innocent kid going to college yeah, yeah. and just was derailed. No, you know, like, and as I said, I tried to take responsibility for those. I was mm -hmm. offered to plead. I said, yeah, I'll yeah. plead to that. I'm just not going to plead to this. And this is something that came out at And parole. this is something you're sitting, you're waiting trial for other cases and they hit you like, oh, also, by the way, here's a... Right, you okay. know, and so, of course, you know, when you get hit with these cases yep. and you hear the facts and you look and you're like, yeah, I, that that wasn't me, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so that's how I was. I was just like, all right, look, um, I'll take this, but I didn't take, I didn't right. do this. So, you know, they got to figure out why, because I didn't do that. I don't know anything about this particular okay. particular crime. So why did you explain to me about when you first get up to Charles Street Jail? You know, Charles Street was live. Mm -hmm. It was live. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie for a young kid like that was in the mindset that I was in. It was live. You know, um, everybody I knew was there, mm -hmm. you know, so it was a lot of familiar faces, but it was also mundane, meaning that if you was in the main jail, you locked in at three o'clock, your day end. You know, if you was in Attics or um, the Marge unit, the Marge unit actually got transferred to Walpole when okay. Child Street Jail closed. But when you when you were in those, you stayed out till like eight o'clock or like about nine or something. And how did you they know. determine where you go? That was the thing. You, you know, that, I don't know how they determined that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I got lucky after a while being there and being transferred to like all these other um, cause I, I got transferred to Worcester. I got transferred to, um, what was the other jail I got transferred to, but every jail I went yeah. to, I was fighting and getting into a whole lot of stuff. So they would send me back mm -hmm. and eventually somehow that landed me into the, into the March. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the March unit, because of the privilege of being out at night, that kind of cooled you down, you know? So you didn't want to lose that privilege. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So. But at the main jail, your day was over at 3 o'clock. Gotcha. Yeah. So you're sitting there. You're trying to plead out to this, this, and that, but they want you to plead out to everything. So eventually, now what? You have to go to trial? Exactly. Okay, so just talk about what's that experience like. I never, Besides juvenile, I've never took anything to trial. So like I said, you kind of have that Perry Mason idea in your mind about how trial plays. But, you know, what was fascinating to me was that you know, there was one particular guy who said they, he knew me from previous and that I've been to his house, all of which was a lie. Mm -hmm. Never knew this guy, never met him. Um, and then, but they brought him in two weeks, two weeks into when we're getting ready to go to trial in violation of all discovery, mm -hmm. right? All discovery law rules and said, oh, wait a minute. And this is only because, let me just back up. Mm -hmm. The first person that they got to say that I was there um, was a woman who obviously was lying, said that I wrote her five threatening letters while I was in Chow Street Jail mm -hmm. and saying I got a nine millimeter with a bullet with her wow. name on it. So did were there actual letters at all? Was so she, if you she said five she letters, had was five letters. I asked my attorney, told my attorney, look. I never wrote this woman, don't know this woman. I don't know what she's talking about. I want to take a handwriting test. Mm. He was against it. He was, because he just Did he thought, think you were bullshitting? He just thought I was a young kid trying to convince him, yeah. right? It wasn't until he got the, he got that summons to show that there was someone that actually looked like me that actually was still, was committing crimes the same kind of crimes that I was committing. Wow. It wasn't until that he got that some time later that he started to really believe that I didn't do this particular crime. But anyway, I tells him, I want to take the handwriting test. We in court. I tell him if he doesn't say it, I'm going to stand up and tell the judge that I want a handwriting test. He says it in a way that I kind of like always remember because it was like, 
I picked up that he was communicating something to the judge. And what he was communicating was that like, uh, my client wants to take a handwriting test. Um, I, you know, I advised my client not to. However, he's insistent on doing that. And the DA jumped up, oh, uh, mm -hmm. we want one too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. To five, it went from having five letters to they, now they can only find one. <laughs> they said they secured the five letters. Right. Now, only seven, seven, eight months later, they only could produce one. They ran a handwritten test. It came back, not mine. The FBI did a, found a fingerprint on it. The fingerprint came back, not mine. Okay. So they, it disqualified this lady who they knew was lying in the beginning. She said she was with her brother. Her brother came and said, yo, we came after the fact. <laughs> yeah. we, didn't, we, we heard about what happened. We didn't yeah. even, you know, so she's lying. So now with that, they introduced this person two weeks in violation of all discovery, said no one else ever looked at no photo arrays, nothing like that. Suddenly, guess what? We got this guy who says he. And then when you listen to what this guy said, uh, in con according to the Commonwealth's theory about what happened, mm -hmm. it was all inconsistent what he said. He, he didn't even know, how, he didn't know my name, couldn't mm -hmm. say, he couldn't say the, vic the surviving victim's name. He called him something else. And then by the time, this was during the suppression hearing when okay. all this came out. So he was so far from the facts of what they said alleged happened to by the time he got on trial, his story matched mm, identically. <laughs> to, <laughs> so I would say, how does that happen? How does mm -hmm. that happen when he just testified all inconsistent to yeah. this, which shows that he's, he's lying, he's making, he's making this up. But nonetheless... And this has been one of my. Oh. What's your theory on who this guy was? Why was he do, just some random guy? Maybe had, he had some a, trouble himself. He, of course, he had some trouble. They made some sort of deal with him. Yeah. Um, not only that, you know, I learned later that he was drugged. Mm. He was someone that was addicted to drugs, yeah. which is part of this this thing that they this part of this tactic in which they use. You know, those who are you know vulnerable, they exploit them. You know, to their to their ability. Yeah. Most times, some of them folks pick up cases. Mm -hmm. You know, they got habits. They're not trying to be locked away. You know, yeah, that's their out. And so, you know, they tell them, "Hey, I need you. I need you for this. Mm -hmm. You know, you do this. Well, I got you. You know, you ain't got to never worry about that." Got you. you what's know. what's your confidence level during during trial as things are starting to play out? Are you thinking that you're you're done? You're smoked? Are you thinking there's a chance it might go your way? My so. I really can't count my first time because my first time I was under the Perry Mason mm -hmm. um, delusion. Almost. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. You know, I didn't understand how it worked, but I, I flipped my case. Um, I actually flipped my case like a, a few times. So I flipped my case um, like eight years later. I went back on trial in 1997, and then uh, and it's the interesting thing is that my lawyer then Robert Shekintoff was probably one of the best appellate attorneys um, at the time in Massachusetts. And let me tell you, he did such a good job at the trial stage. Like, mm -hmm. it really surprised me. Like, he did such an excellent job that the DA came over and was like, man, they should have just let me plead him out to something now, yeah. you know. <laughs> and... I didn't want to plead out to anything. You know, it was the same thing. They offered me a few deals. I said, no, um, I didn't do this. And they was like, well, you know, you could be out in a couple of years. You know, you already got eight years in, you know, and I was just like, nah, I'm all set. Mm -hmm. So I went back on trial. Robert did the damn thing so much that the DA came over to the table and thought he was going to lose. Mm -hmm. So we were all surprised when they came back <laughs> and, and, and convict me. Yeah. What, so just Talk, what's your mindset like that? That especially that second time, you're saying a little, you guys a little bit more confident just to get that guilty. Like, what's that feel like? What's what's that thought process? I mean, it's I think it's a it's a difference for when you know you have someone that fought, that really really fought for you. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I, I didn't feel as bad. It wasn't as I like did things the left on time. the table. You felt right. like there no, might have been things left like, on the table. No, I felt like my my attorney really fought for me. He did his job. 
as opposed to the first time you, you weren't feeling that. Exactly. So just talk about that feeling, that first time you get out of trial, you're thinking like, man, this dude didn't even say this, that, or, well, or you like, it, did it really I wasn't hit in, you? Like, I wasn't thinking in terms of that. I was thinking in terms of, you know, like I said, the Perry Mason thing. Like I was thinking that the system worked one way mm -hmm. and it didn't. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I it was apparent to me that once the my attorney realized he wasn't going to be allowed to introduce the evidence, which he thought was a sure pop, yeah. you know, that he's begin to fight at that point. But by that time, you know, it was already, you know, and I think it also caused him to make some mistakes along the way. Um, I think, you know, and that's looking, you know, yeah. with, with, with clear, clear yeah, buoyance, yeah, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. like you would mention Walpole. What, 17? When you get up 18, by the time you get up there? Yeah. And we're talking about at that time, I believe at one point, Walpole, Angola, and Sing Sing, top three uh, most violent prisons in the country. Yeah. Talk Fact. about that experience. Well, when I got there, it was it was violent. Everything yeah. that you heard about Walpole was true. Uh, it was predatory. Every day was a freeze up. Every single day. It wasn't like... Um, once a month, or and when I talk about freeze up, it wasn't just no, you know, fist right. fights. You know, there, people things. being stabbed, water, hot water, boiling water was being thrown mm -hmm. on folks. You know, it was it was crazy. Folks was being raped. You know, yeah. um, it was so it was all it types of know. stuff jumping off there, and it felt like the streets, like yeah. literally, you was in the streets, but you was captive right. in the streets. You know, like there's no running. Is, <laughs> that's the only difference. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where you gonna go? <laughs> it, exactly. And you know, and most of those guys up there, you know, they boxed like they trained for warfare. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what they did. That was the the rule of the day. Everybody, yeah. you know, whites, blacks, Puerto Rican, everyone trained for warfare, and they read warfare books. Yeah. So the art of war. Prince Machiavelli, mm -hmm. um, those were like mandatory books that you read, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when you came up there. Right. And it's and it so interesting to me because, you know, like those books weren't really designed to, to do that, but to take on systems, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, everyone was like schooled in these things and they kind of like, it kind of governed mm -hmm. the way that they, that they operated. So us coming in as young kids, you know, some of the older, black guys would tell us the rules the do's and don'ts or what have you yeah. um and you know we followed we we followed that as much as we could mm -hmm. and uh, you know and they was real strict like you couldn't even say the n-word mm -hmm. up there they would tell you like listen we ain't telling you what to do right but you know if you use that word you know, you liable to get into some things, something yeah. about that because we don't fault to establish that word not to be used up here. And they, they were serious about that. And so even like with some of the older cats that from that time, if they hear dudes using that, you know, it's like it's automatic wartime for them, you know, mm -hmm. like and for a young age, they don't even understand what's going on. They're like, yo, why is this dude tripping like that? You know what I'm saying? But that's that's how it was when I came up there. So when you get up there and you're seeing all this violence, are you already accustomed to it because of the streets? Or is it more first kind of a little closer than you thought? And is it looking I mean, back kind of traumatic? I mean, when I first got up there, I mean, you hear all the stories. Mm -hmm. So you kind of think in terms of everything you think about prison and, and all that. And I think for me, I was just like focused on, okay, the first dude that ever tried to make a, pass or yeah. try that gay stuff with me you know you got to really do something to let them know mm -hmm. you ain't playing those types of games so i think that that's probably was on everybody's mind coming right. through there for the first time it's almost like you want to get it over with we're kind of waiting for somebody to <laughs> say something that way you can kind of you know but, show people that you ain't really but when we when we got together as a bunch of young kids up there like we started to see when we saw how it was i think for us youth was on our side you know because most of us didn't get high. Mm -hmm. We didn't have, you know, dope issues, yeah. coke issues. We didn't have none of that. So, you know, the, the thing for us was that if you went to war with one of us, you went to war with all of us. Mm -hmm. And it didn't, and so we developed, it ain't where you're from, it's where you at. Yeah. And so th that's what made the group of young kids from Springfield to Brockton to wherever you was from, if you was above board standard, meaning you wasn't a rat, you know, mm -hmm. you didn't do no crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I could, like being a Skinner, mm -hmm. raping no kids, then, you know, you can convert, you can get with us. And 
whatever whatever happens, we all stuck together. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we changed the dynamics because the number one rule was that you didn't fight in the child hall, you didn't fight in the hall, you know, dudes would be just like, yo, yeah. you, you come, you know, you know, meet me outside. Right. You know, it mm -hmm. was like, meet me in the yard and you knew what that meant, you mm -hmm. know? So if you told one of us that and you came to the table and said, meet me in the yard, then, you know, we would set it on you right then and there. Gotcha. And we would move on you. All of us would move on you. Mm -hmm. So As we, a unit. As a as yeah. a unit, so he wasn't getting no fair way. These mm -hmm. dudes was these dudes were in Lou Ferrigno <laughs> shape, like you know free weights back then. I take it like <laughs> they was they was like literally like. So did you not have to go to Concord because of your charge it right to the uh, Shirley? I yep. mean not Shirley Max, right to um, Walpole. Yeah. How long were you in Walpole that eighth year? When now you're trying to flip your case, you eventually get out of there before then. No. So mm -hmm. so. For the first couple of years, I was in Walpole, and then because of so much violence that was going on, Walpole actually decided to ship me to Norfolk to separate me and others like Derek Tyler and all of us because we, by that time, there was an ongoing war mm -hmm. and that they was trying to get a hold of. And so they felt the most influential people in that conflict was me and Derek. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to separate me and Derek from each other. Gotcha. And then I ended up picking up a, a, my first DSU, which is Department of Segregation Unit, for an assault. And they shipped me back to Walpole, but I was in the DSU unit okay. for a while. And so during that, after I got out of DSU, you know, when I was back in Walpole and I stayed there for for a little while. Okay, so talk when you get to Norfolk, what's one of the first things you notice about the difference? Norfolk was a, a back then. They say it's the it, the biggest one, right? They house yeah, the most Norfolk, people. Yeah, Norfolk was the <laughs> well, the interesting thing is when they came and got me, they came and got me from the chow hall. Wow. So <laughs> Derek was being, you know, was being released from from um from the AA block. And so as soon as we all came together in the chow, they came to the chow hall and was like um yeah, you, you're being transferred. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I ain't seen no class board or nothing. And he was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> but your stuff is going to be transferred with you. We, we, we're going to escort you down to the um, to new men's. And I was like, where am I going? And he was like, to Norfolk. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and I was like, what is this about? I, like, right, I, didn't, right. I didn't know anything about how they do this. Yeah. You know, like, I, I was just like, what is this about? Like, and they was just like, yo. Going we're gonna separate you and Tyler. We mm -hmm. don't want you two on the camp that's together. Right. So that's how I got there. When I got there, you know, of course, a, a lot of the young folks um, that I knew were there, um, and some of which were on their way back to kind of join into the conflict that was going on. Mm -hmm. So when I got there for that little brief moment, Norfolk was like completely. It was like night and day. Yeah. I mean. There was still violence, but it wasn't like like mm -hmm. Walpole. Like nothing was like Walpole, right, 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 you know. Right. But but they they were serving chicken, yeah. they were serving <laughs> ice cream. They had people with like you know actual like radios with the with mm -hmm. the um you know tape decks on yeah. it, you know. And this is before they stopped that. Like they stopped that a little bit after I came in. And so, you know, I was down there for a little while catching up on all yeah. the new music, the the NWA, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff that was that was like prevalent at the time. Did you have like more access to the legal stuff in Norfolk? Oh yeah, the Just, access to the legals there they probably have one of the best libraries in the system, mm -hmm. you know, as far as as far as like library access goes. Um, they're so open because they they, they actually run as a community yeah, um, prison and the the, the prison was given to the Department of Correction under a trust like that. Mm. So anytime that the department moves away from that, the people who still manage in that trust can take that property oh, away. That's why, that's, it's why, to stay. that's why it's managed to stay that way for all this time. Mm. You know, it was it was given to them only if they run it as a community. Wow. You know, under a so if it was prison. up to them, it would probably be ran just like everywhere else, right? That's why every superintendent for decades, for eons, always say, "This is not Norfolk. Mm -hmm. We're not going to have no. We're not going to have no unit reps. None of that here. None of that." That's why right. they they all resent it. You mm -hmm. know. But so you get that second trial, 
year eight, and then what? You see parole at year fifteen. Yep, at year okay. fifteen. What's that experience like? I mean, like we we talked about it earlier about the whole not. So realistically. Taking, Plus, I feel like they always say, hey, you get the five-year setback, so you kind of go in there kind of thinking it's it's a long shot anyway. Well, realis- realistically, because I was, you know, I was active in the prison mm-hmm. and sometimes in all the wrong ways, yeah. I didn't have, I didn't really feel like I had a um, real good opportunity at parole. Two, I kind of wrote parole off, mm-hmm. you know, because I felt like, I knew at the time they expected you to come in and say you did it, you did it, whether you did or not. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I just wasn't going to do that. And so I went in there and I told my truth. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I just remember, (laughs) I remember that, that, that when they heard me, they was just like, okay, has anybody got any questions? Um, And, Everyone just went down the road. Nope, 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 nope. Mm. And bang, it Is was it, over with. You know. What they say? Come, come back in five years, three Set years. Set me back five years. Five. I got, I got hit with a two, five year setback twice. Mm, okay. You know, then a three year setback. So, right. Wow. So, it, and each time, I think, you know, especially moving up to the to the third time. You know, I, I had to ask them, did they think that there was something abnormal mm-hmm. in my thinking? Right. You know, do do they think that I want to stay in prison? Do mm-hmm. they think I want to die in prison? You know, what benefit do I have to by coming before you and saying that I d- didn't do something that right. I did? What benefit would that exactly. be? I didn't, I didn't told you about every other thing that I done did, you mm-hmm. know, and one of which was a manslaughter, mm-hmm. you know, so it's not like. I'm not taking responsibility. Right. It's this is what happened to a lot of us given in that time. When I did that, um, actually spoke to that, I think it allowed the pro, some of the parole members to really question, the, you know, yeah. their position about like why would I'm he be in, adamant on this, knowing it's gonna probably mess up his parole? Like why wouldn't he? You know, I'm sure I got to think he might really be innocent of that. Particular. So some of them actually went and read the transcripts. They actually went and read it. And, not, and the thing that I haven't told you is that that key witness came to my parole hearing and offered to talk to them during the parole hearing. And that parole board refused to talk to him. On your behalf? On my behalf. Saying pretty much he lied. Was that it he the, lied. the guy? That he, he lied. lied. Wow, and they you weren't know, trying to hear he that. He stood up. The DA, the DA first made his presentation to say, hey, you know, this guy's not accepting responsibility, blah, blah, blah. And he used his name in the process of it. And then when my attorney got up to rebut what he said, he said, hey, look, that guy in which he referred to mm-hmm. is right there. And he stood up mm-hmm. and he's willing to ask, answer any question before wow. the parole board right now. And the, and the parole board was like, no, they, at that They time, pretty much said they have no questions for him or they just didn't allow it? Nope, they they refused to question him. Wow. Why? You know, Why do you think that is? At that time, I think they just wasn't ready to deal with a cert, you know, situation that way. And, you know, let's be real. Most of the head appointees of the parole boards were prosecutors, yeah. you know, at the time. You know, just now, prosecutors if they come from your district, started recusing themselves because they may or may not have been influenced mm. by, yeah, but that wasn't something that historically went on. There's a few who are judges now who sat on parole hearings, right? Mm-hmm. And made decisions, you know, even though your case came out of, came through their office. And so what, what else are they gonna think? Right, right. Of course they don't wanna hear nothing contradictory to that. And, and then for the purposes of parole, you know, it's, it's really a question of you've already been decided guilty. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> you yeah. know, we're not talking, we're not taking up innocence. Right, as far as we're concerned, the system said you were guilty, you're guilty. Now, do you accept responsibility for that guilt? You know, and that's how some of the, some of the you know, decisions are made, mm-hmm. were made back then. I think now there's been a lot of flexibility to actually consider what we now know uh, ingredients that made up in mass mm-hmm. incarceration, but also just wrongful convictions because we have an alarming rate of those, you know, and so. 
Okay, so like reading the law, that could be very confusing and intimidating for some people. Like at first you could sit there and read it, but you might not understand. At, at some point, does it start to click for you? Are you starting to understand it a little better? Um, so when I first started reading the law, you know, <laughs> I, might as well have been Mandarin. <laughs> I mean, like you have a layman's un- interpretation of it. You don't. Mm-hmm. It's not. You know, you don't understand it. It's a whole different language in of itself, but. You know, and I've told this story many times that, you know, the older cats would watch me. You know, they knew that I used to be in a lot of stuff, but they was, I was always committed to that. Yeah. Even when I was in the hole, I'd go mm-hmm. to the law library. And so after a while, they're just watching me, you know, and, this, and I ain't talking about for like two months or so. I'm yeah. talking about for some time. Yeah. You know, some of them started coming over and saying, hey, yo, I see you down here. And you're committed to learning this. So if you got any questions, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? That's how they did it back then. Wow, okay. You know, because they don't want to waste their time. Yeah. You know, and so I started, you know, I started developing a community of folks that I could turn to to ask questions about what did, yeah. what does at, this and this mean? At any point, did you become that guy for other people maybe? I did. Why I actually, was that important? I actually taught law class. Okay. You know, um, why I, was that important to you? And talk about how you taught that. Well, the reason why I taught the law classes is because I couldn't possibly help everybody. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I became one of the best in the system at the time. And so your name would travel mm-hmm. throughout the Department of Corrections and people would reach out to me all across the Department of Corrections saying, yo, I need you to work on my case, blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. And so you can only imagine at the facility itself how many people wanted me to kind of work on their case. Yeah. And so that was impossible. Yeah, but what I wanted to everybody. do was arm them with the tools to learn themselves so that they can wield it and then invest the time that yeah. they that needed because I just couldn't do it for everyone. Mm-hmm. And when I took someone's case, it, you know, I wasn't turning them out like in like in 30 days, yeah, like right. it was a pancake. You know, that took a lot of study and, and dissecting and understanding all the the nuances to it because the benefit for me was that I would actually get what really happened. Mm-hmm unlike others, the attorneys, and then I could, it would allow me to be able to see where the prosecutors actually fudged and made up the stories, and then I can easily break that link wow. to show where they actually lied at. Well, you that's know amazing, man. So why don't you just walk me through the events that lead up to you eventually, you get out, is it the parole, or do you get another trial? No, I, I, actually, I actually get a parole, well, well actually, I, I flipped my case a third time, uh, excuse me, a second time, mm-hmm. and then, um, I come out and for like four and a half months and Fight I'm working at, kinda? yep, okay. I work, I'm working at the Judge Richard L. Banks Community Justice Program. Um, I'm like a paralegal, I'm a community person there. I'm, um, I'm going in and out of DYS talking to young kids about, you know, you know, trying to prevent them from making the next step to trying to de-glamorize yeah. street life. So I'm bringing real relevant guys who are in the streets that people that they know of and bringing them to DYS to reinforce this message. So there's a whole lot of positive things. Uh, the, the SJC reversed my case, so I had to come back. Mm-hmm. And so that's what led me back. Um, after that, I spent the next 17 years um, trying to reverse my case again. And in addition, I'm seeing parole in between time. One of the significant things I wanted to kind of get into before I got get got to that was that the reason why parole, I felt like at least in that time when I got out, that I had became institutionalized. And the reason why I say that is because whenever you close off the door of opportunity to get out of prison, Right. And just say, I'm just going to go through this one route. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to go through the courts. I'm not going to go through all that. Then you have become institutionalized. (laughs) Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And I was sitting at my desk while when I was working at the Judge Banks thinking, like, I really thought that. Like, what made me really think that way? So. When the SJC decision came back, what it was, and some attorneys were reaching out to me like, yo, is that your case um, that came down this morning? And I'm looking it up and I'm seeing that it was it was against me. And, you know, and so anyway, long story short, I come back and now I'm kind of like, okay, I, I'm not closing off 
the door, right? I understand that that I was basically experiencing um, what I would call, for lack of better terms, uh, institutionalization, right? And the reason why I'm saying is because whether we understand it or not, when you, the way you go in, you don't come back out, yeah. you know, the same way. I don't care who you are, you're going to be ill affected by it. And if you're unconscious of the many ways that you are ill affected by it, then that usually tends to lead you back into prison, you know, because you think you're beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. But the fact is, is that COs to the superintendent to us, we're all ill, Ill affected. So I made it that decision to be more conscious about that, and I started opening up doors of opportunity to try to get out to the world, you know, get my life on track, whether that be through the courts, mm -hmm. uh, petitioning and successfully winning, or through the parole. And so I started putting the onus on the parole also mm -hmm. by presenting the facts, you know, and, I'm, and all I said was, you don't have to take my word for it. Look at the record. Right. I'm not asking you to accept that. You've been talking about one position, which is the DA's position, but why you're not asking him about what's in the entire record, yeah. that I was misidentified in another crime, that that description in those cases matches the identical descriptions in this case, to the exact T, down to the word that the person used during the robbery, mm. right? I, I ain't saying this. This is in the record. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, right. know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? That this one witness who I brought before the parole board and the parole board did not want to talk to at that particular time, how this person came in the violation of discovery, right? Last minute after the police said nobody else looked at no, no photo mm -hmm. array, no nothing, right? And all of a sudden, his story in the beginning never matched what they what they said actually happened, and then on the day of trial, miraculously, he has the same story as everybody else. Wow. But all the Commonwealth witnesses said he was not there. The Commonwealth witnesses themselves said he was not there. Wow, they conveniently ignore that. <laughs> so no, but I invited them to to look at look at the entire record. Mm -hmm. No, except what I'm saying. Look at the entire record. I never matched the description, never matched the complexion of the person, nothing. Mm -hmm. So I think that that persuaded them to take a look. Mm -hmm. And then when they actually saw the entire record, mm -hmm. really saw it, which raises a question if they ever really read it in mm -hmm. the beginning. Right. But when they really saw it, at least uh, Miss Bonner you know, had the courage to say, look, I thought I owed this to you because you challenged us to do that last time. And, you know, well, I, she said, I'm going to be honest. I, I wanted to I wanted to vote for you then to mm -hmm. let you out. But I looked at it and I have a problem with the identification wow. made against you. Now, this is on record, yeah, not yeah, a yeah, public yeah. record, yeah. you know. And I think that there's so many. I'm not, I don't want to lose the point that I was getting to, but I just want to say that I think there's so many of us that are ill affected because, you know, for us there's been a practice of not really reading the entire record because mm -hmm. by default right. you're convicted and innocence really not a question right. there. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then, so how does it work? You get a, a, a unanimous vote? So I get a, get a unanimous, vote? well, they tell me, they tell me, there's three of them at the time, tell me during parole um, that they, they, you know, that they, they looked at my record. They believe that I'm rehabilitated, and that um, you know, and that they they were impressed by the way that I've handled mm -hmm. you know my situation, given the fact that I'm innocent. At this point, you're getting a lot less tickets compared to the beginning and stuff like that. You're staying oh, yeah. out of trouble. You're oh, helping yeah. other people. Oh yeah. So I, I was building religious programs. Mm -hmm. um, I was building community programs. Um, you know, I ran cultural programs like the African Heritage Coalition. I also petitioned for Spanish United mm. along with others. And we ran cultural events, you know, for the, you know, throughout the prison. Gotcha. So wherever we went, we reestablished these programs wow. everywhere. And it wasn't just me. It was a, yeah, yeah. it was a group, it was a crew of us that mm -hmm. really put in the work. I'm bringing outside folks, community folks in. And it, it was really, let me tell you, it was really healing for the community and for those men inside who participated in those events. So I'm, I'm a firm believer that, 
you know, you need community and you need family involvement in one's rehabilitation. Yeah. And so the fight just to get those things done, and it's still a fight. Absolutely. You know, like yep. even today, it's still a fight. Um, but nonetheless, and I just want to tell your viewers, when I say that it's still a fight, I mean, they done just decidedly limited um, outside folks to only five people can come. Mm -hmm. So they done reduced a community ops ob observance to a community meeting, wow, right? Wow. Which is just like wholly disrespectful, yeah. you know, wholly disrespectful. So unless you're doing a workshop or you're doing something like, then you can bring as many community folks in. Mm -hmm. But if you're not, then because it's being done consistently mm -hmm. throughout the Department of Corrections now, right? these cultural events, no, this is the way we're going to limit them and, yeah. and impact by marginalizing them this way. Wow. And like this, like this you is, said, the work don't stop. You've been out. Tell me about the work you've been doing since you've been out. Well, I've been just continuing on the work. Mm -hmm. um, so I was privileged to work at Prison Legal Service on invitation of Latoya Whiteside, who was the director of um, REICI, Racial Equity and Correction Initiative, and by Liz Matos, who was the head of, uh, director of, of prison legal service at the time. And so, you know, I was privileged to continue on my advocation that I was doing behind the wall mm -hmm. in this capacity, which I enjoy doing because I understand where brothers is at. I understand where the sisters who are suffering and most mm -hmm. of which the sisters never really get talked yeah. about. But their conditions is, is way worse than the men. And, it's you know, I just want to publicly acknowledge that, right? That they don't get a lot of the stuff that we have fought for. And because they are not as many, um, mm -hmm. it's the, you know, the fight has been really hard for them yeah. because they don't, they haven't came through a lot of what we've came through in the men prison. So they're just now undergoing a lot of that just to get the basics. Wow. Just to get the basics. And so, you know, I think for me, being in this role has allowed me to kind of like continue to use my talent yeah. to serve my community. Yeah. And also, I, I, I owe that debt to my community, yeah. you know, to, to make sure that the youngins coming after us, you know, don't fall into these traps. Yeah. The other thing is that if they do, that the folks who are responsible to doing the job of rehabilitation actually do the job of rehabilitating mm -hmm. them. You know what I'm saying? So that's how I see my role. I'm grateful. Um, the building of Assets Mass to complement that role really for me is an extension of the work because it allows me to deal directly with the community and to really kind of create that healing process in which the cultural events, you know, simulate it for me. Um, so mm -hmm. that's that's what I like. So what's the main, speaking of the youth, what's the main message that you wanted to get across to them by coming up here today and speaking? Well, one of the things that I really want to get across to the youth all across the Massachusetts is that, yo, man, this is a design game that they're playing. Whether they understand it or not, that's truly what it is, mm -hmm. you know, and that what, what it's designed to do is to make sure that if you're not in an early grave, right, that you're feeding the next person's family for the next 20 something odd years. Meaning you're feeding the lawyer, you're feeding the prosecutors, the drug task force, mm. or the or the, the gang task force. You're feeding their family, the judges, and then when you get upstate or the county, you're feeding the correctional officers, the superintendents, the mm -hmm. LT, you're feeding. So everyone is benefiting off of you. While well, your family's paying. Except your family. Yeah. Except those that you say you truly love. With all the glorification and glamorization of prison, jail, that whole lifestyle, just talk about like the worst part to really let it resonate. Well, the worst part, man, is that you're dead. Buried alive. You're buried alive. You're dead. Yeah. You know, I don't care what, man, I don't care what anybody say. Being out here, being able to be among your family, be among the people that love you is heaven yeah. here on earth. Yeah. Right? Facts. That's that's what it is. When you're there in this makeshift community, isolated among nothing but men, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? 
and the hostilities of just the, what the what the environment produces be of, because you're captive in that in that way. Um, there's nothing slick about being locked up. No, no, Everyone no. locked up is trying to get the hell out. Mm -hmm. They're not there saying, you know what, I'm going to chill another five years. Yeah, right. I'm going to chill. You know what, man? I'm, I could see parole, but I'm going to chill. I'm going to chill six years just to hang out with my mm -hmm. boy. No, everybody in there is trying to get the hell out right. and mean it, right? Mm -hmm. and, they, and whether they be real with their homies or not, you yeah. know, whether they lost their girl, oh. you know what I'm saying, lost their family. Mm -hmm. And I'm, when I say lost, I mean... People come out are dead now. Dead, in fact. Your mother died. Your father died. Your grandmother died. You know, things, th th time you ain't gonna never get back, mm -hmm. right? Never get back. That's what they're robbing of you by you playing this game that yeah. benefits everybody but you. So mm -hmm. even if you're getting a little bit of bread, right. you're getting a little bit of bread, you may think it's big bread, but the bread they're gonna get out of you for the next. Whether that's in the federal pen or whether mm -hmm. here, the bread they're going to get out of you is going to last a lifetime. Yeah. They're going to get that in some. Longevity. <laughs> 30, 30, 30 plus years inside. Tell me, what have you learned about yourself in all that time? There's a lot of time to self-reflect. Well, let me tell you something, man. First and foremost, um, I've, I've, I've run across a lot of smart, intellectual individuals that are, that are locked. You know, and let me, so I want to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. But the, the one thing that I realized, which is prevalent in particularly in black and brown communities, is that there's this there's this connection to God himself. Right. To say that yeah, most of our suffering means something. Mm -hmm. There has to be a, some sort of purpose for it. Some of us reconcile with that idea. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we have to reconcile with the person that we became, you know, to the person we are, mm -hmm. you know, and. And so I truly, for me, um, and I can only speak for myself, is that what I've learned really came from really self-evaluating, reading history at large, mm -hmm. you know, and, and really my faith in God and yeah. Allah, you know, um, really is what really aided me to be able to sustain and to keep moving forward even though I was facing some of the most detrimental stuff, yeah. meaning like hunger strikes, mm -hmm. you know, where I thought that I was on the verge of dying. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And and came through by the grace of Allah. Yeah. You know That's what I'm a, saying? Amazing. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, and, and, and as a result of the sacrifice and that commitment, for me, in my mind, even when I came back, you know, after being out for that little brief moment, I had to ask myself, like, like, what? Why did I come back? Right. I still don't understand yeah. why I came back. But for me, I think that I had a job to do while I was there, and I was the person to do that job, yeah. among others who, you know, who right. learned from me, who built with me, who was part of that structure from the beginning, and you know, we all had a job to do. And then once that job was done, at least my part of it, yeah. then I would come out and do the work that I'm doing out here. Yeah, your signature is definitely stamped within, you know, helping other people, helping yourself, even just making all the noise that you made that people know of you. But like you said, people are in there fighting to get out, like really get out. What advice do you give to those people fighting in there? Because not every day is a good day. Sometimes you might feel like giving up. What advice do you give to that? To well, you know, and I, I, shoot, let me tell you, 33 years is a long time. Most mm -hmm. people would have gave up a long time ago that there's something waiting for you on the other side, yeah. you know, just keep at it, keep you know. On. Sometimes it doesn't happen when you think it should happen, mm -hmm. but it's going to happen. You, you just got to stay consistent. You can't quit. Nah. Success comes to the people who never quit. You and, know, you're never going to get it if you stop. And, and I tell you, you know, most people who are guided by logic and not by faith, mm -hmm. by spiritual faith, even when they come through that, usually they wind up back because there's the misstep is that they never evolved spiritually. spiritually. There's three dimensions of yourself. Mm -hmm. And well, some say seven and others right. say more, but for the, for the, for this conversation, when you talk about mentally, physically, and spiritually, and you, and you miss that spiritual, well then, you know, logic can only take you so far, right. you know, and I've seen this by some of, you know, some of the folks who have the best logic in the world, but spiritually empty, you know, and and really because the way that 
religion has been given to us, yeah. you know, then in the many forms and the many distortions. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, not to say that they, you know, I don't understand that. I understand that. But then they don't understand that what they're doing by robbing themselves of that development is putting themselves at large because yeah. how do you cope? Mm -hmm. How do you adjust, right? Yeah. When logic fails. Mm -hmm. Stunting the, your growth emotionally, spiritually, all that. Fact. You know? Like Fact. you said, there's only f so far logic is going to get you. So, man, I, I appreciate you coming through. If there was like anything that you wanted to touch on, maybe you didn't get a chance to, or even just like some closing words mm. to kind of wrap this up, to, now's well, your chance, man. And, and once again, I, pre I really appreciate you coming through. Well, it's a pleasure for me to come on things like this, man. When I see brothers like yourself and others who are just doing this work, spreading the word, getting folks to really understand that all this great talent behind the wall and also the consequences that l that allowed people to get into these search, you know, these situations. I really believe that, you know, like you're fulfilling a purpose, yeah. right? You know, I think for me, if I had any message to give for those who are unaccustomed to this life um, or unaware about just how the system works, to ask questions, mm -hmm. you know, to really, you know, because for me, the everything that's being done by the Commonwealth is being done in your name mm -hmm. as being part of the, the Commonwealth, Commonwealth. Yeah, <laughs> right? You know, Don't so just take everything for face value. So It'll you have you. to be responsible for that, you know, and if you're not, at some point, it's going to impact you, whether mm -hmm. it's your son, mm -hmm. whether it's your daughter whether, you know, drugs find you yourself, you know yeah. what I'm saying? It's going to impact you, you know? And and then when you find the root of it all, you're going to say, damn, I should have took an earlier stance. Yeah, and it's never too late to be impacted. But a lot of us get impacted young, but mm -hmm. you never know. Like that's you said, it could be, could be your son, grandson. And, that's, that's or you fact. could get into something like something drinking and driving. You know what I mean? There's plenty of people who go their whole life. You see them 50 some Roll years rage. old, first time in, and it's like you're dealing with the consequences. Yeah, so. and most people, most people are just not aware of, mm -hmm. of that. I mean, because they're saying it doesn't, aff it doesn't impact them. A lot of them, them don't care either. Unfortunately, that's the harsh truth. A lot of people just don't care until it does impact them. Fact. So Fact. it might impact you at one point. And, and once again, I appreciate you coming up. Yeah, man. We out of time. It's this has pleasure. been, hey, this has been great. Guys, <laughs> that's Mac Hudson. <laughs> yeah. I'm B. Luke. This is the Bounce Back Podcast. Remember, it is what it is. What's next is what you make it. On that note, we out of here. Peace. Peace. Got a moment when they see you down, there's no way loving.